Good morning. Good morning. All right. All right. You tell somebody you look good in church. Tell them this is a new look for you. You look good in church. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We got a packed house. Just excuse us as we set up our living room here. Thank you for taking the time to come out and be with us. How many of you watch this show, This Is Us? <laughs> As, um, as many of you know, This Is Us is a, is a popular TV drama series about a couple and their three kids. And the show goes back and forth between their lives as kids growing up and their present situation as adults and, and all the, the drama that they've experienced and how it's shaped them to this day. And it's a really popular series nominated for a lot of awards. And if you watch it, you love it or you hate it. It's emotional. It pulls at your heart strings. And like any good series, you, you get into the lives of these people and you're hurt with them and you rejoice with them. You forget that they're actors, right? You hurt with them and you rejoice with them for a little while and you're engrossed in their lives and you feel in some strange way connected to them. Amen? So yeah, this presentation has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with the show. We chose the title, This Is Us, because instead of putting on some, some dazzling, you know, presentation to, to try to impress you that are visiting today, and, and instead of trying to present some polished play of, of what we do here and, and who we are in an effort to grab your attention and hold you here and hopefully have you become a part of what we're doing here, we chose instead to be regular this morning. To let you meet a few of us and to know a little bit about us and who we are and how we've come to this place with God. There are a hundred stories in this building just like these. Maybe even one just like yours. So this isn't, just for the, for the record, this isn't some Easter play. These are not actors. This isn't some grand production that we've been working on for months. We did it once. This is us. So listen in. Good morning. My name is Pastor Melissa. The kids call me Pastor Mo. But I think my favorite nickname that I've been given is Flash. And it is funny. So I came by it because one day my good friend Daisy, she called me, she said, hey Mo, how are things going? And I said, oh my gosh, amazing. I had done my food shopping, I put it away, I cleaned my house, I had made breakfast, I had washed the dishes, I had prepped dinner. I even think I talked to my mom. And it was about 9.30 in the morning. So I am the crazy woman who does whatever it takes so that my family, my friends, my church can have what they need. In fact, by the time some of you get here, typically our family has been here for a long time, straightening chairs, straightening rooms, taking out garbage, whatever it takes, because we don't want anything to distract you from what God may have to tell you. And most of the time, I think people appreciate it. But one time, someone passed by me as I was running to close off a section. It was a special event. And they said, hey, Martha. Some of you are giggling because you know where I'm going. And it felt like somebody just punched like the wind out of, my, out of my chest. For those of you who don't know, Martha was the sister of Mary and Lazarus. 
And what preachers always preach about is that the day that Jesus and the disciples came to eat at her house, she got angry because she was busy working and preparing. And all of a sudden she said, Jesus, don't you care that my sister Mary is just sitting there at your feet? Tell her to come and help. And he said, Martha, Mary has chosen what was right, which was to be in the presence of God. So imagine how I felt. That's what he thought about me. Didn't he know that Martha had entertained Jesus many times, that she served him and there wasn't a problem? That the fact that she spoke to him like that, even though it was wrong, shows that they were intimate. They were friendly. Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. They were good friends. Didn't he know that she was the one that when her brother died, she boldly told Jesus, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would have lived. But I know you can just say the word and he will answer. And that day, her faith saw her brother resurrected again. In other words, in my mind, all that was going on, didn't he know that I was so much more than just a person that he stopped when I was busy to say hello? But the answer is no. Because people will often define us by our weaknesses, by our lack, by our mistakes, by our errors. But the worst part is we do it to ourselves. I know there's many times that a word that someone was spoken or something that someone has said or a situation has caused me to question everything that I knew to be true. I know that there are some of us that it stopped us from achieving our dreams or fixing a relationship or maybe even changing or even going to church. A lot of times we go to a church, we don't like a song and we just give up. We don't see the big picture. But thank God that Jesus does. You know, he doesn't define us by any of those things. I mean, sure, I know there have been plenty of times when I've been in this house and running past someone and a little annoyed that no one's helping. <laughs> but I also know that God doesn't just see that moment he sees the woman who sings in her car with all her might. He sees the woman that loves children so much. He sees the mother that wakes up at the crack of dawn because she wants to spend time with her kids, so everything has to be done so that they can be first. He sees the woman who loves so passionately because a life with God is amazing. I'm a woman that's grateful to my Savior, and I want, no matter how old or how young you are, I want you to know that Jesus is great, and a life with him can change you forever. So in case you're wondering what kind of people go to this church, it's hyperactive, like me and Tony, hardworking, passionate people who love hard. This is me, and this is us. Good morning, church. My name is Lee. I'm a minister here at the Sanctuary Fellowship. Most of you know my story. Orphaned as a baby from another country, sold into this one, raised in the Jewish faith, physically and emotionally abused by the only mother I ever knew. I was tormented emotionally and verbally, and I was made to just feel like I simply never belonged anywhere. Then I got orphaned all over again, and I became a ward of New York State while I was in foster care. Did you know that meant that New York State owned me? They owned me, like a piece of property, or at least that's just what it felt like. Or maybe you owned a piece of me, because every single one of your tax dollars paid for every bed I ever slept in while I was in foster care. So thank you for that. Well, all I know was that I certainly didn't belong to my God-given birthright. And when I say my birthright, I mean my bloodline. I mean my biological family. I always wanted to know them as a child. I, I think I've shared that with you before. And I actually had this fantasy that one day they would come back for me. 
It's kind of every foster care, every orphan's dream. I dreamt of this worldwide search happening, happening where my mother and my father, they'd call in every resource that they could attain and tirelessly search until I was found. I even dreamt that my forever home would be a 10,000 square foot mansion complete with chauffeur and maids and an indoor outdoor pool and maybe even a dog. My fantasies were definitely the deliverance and my hope as a kid. Just think Annie, right? Anybody in that picture in their head? Annie, right? That was me. I was the quintessential orphan. Well, this year, after a series of very, very long events, I decided that I finally wanted to crush the fantasy and find out who my biological family was. I thought that I would search and that I ultimately would find. Never ever did I consider the feelings and the spiritual obstacles that I would run into. See, up until this point, I really thought that I was totally okay and totally at peace with the suffering that I had went through as a child. Until the day that I discovered and received the paperwork from the Colombian government on my adoption. It really was like those pages were alive and it was like they were staring me dead at my face and I felt so intimidated more intimidated than I have ever felt almost in my entire life. And I, as I looked over the information and the papers, I noticed that there was this really large dollar amount. And it was kind of just looking at me. And immediately, I understood what I was staring at. It was the actual dollar amount that I had been sold for. It was the actual price tag. It was the worth that man had put on my three-month-old life. It literally, it literally took my breath away. It numbed me, it confused me, and it made me feel like that little girl who was completely helpless all over again. So here I am, right? I'm a grown woman, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a minister, I'm a friend, I'm a child of God, but in that moment, I'm really not sure. And this moment wasn't too long ago. And in that moment, I wasn't sure who I was at all. I was taken back to the days where I had mental illness and I had struggled as a teen. I remembered every suicide attempt brought on by the anxiety and the depression. I remembered being locked up in a mental hospital. I remembered the seven long years of intensive therapy I received by psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers. I remembered interpreting ink blocks, ink blots, just to see, just so that they could see if I was crazy. I remembered all the medications that they gave me to dull the torment of the rejection and the abuse. In that moment, I started to question God, his sovereignty and his goodness in a way that I hadn't done in over 20 years. In times like these, where I doubt, where you doubt, the promises of God. I am so grateful that we have the word of God as our sword and our shield. Amen? Amen. I'm reminded of Mary Magdalene's story. She's the woman in Luke 8 who was delivered of seven evil spirits. The Bible doesn't actually say what kind of torment she walked through, but it does say that the day Jesus met her, he delivered her and she became miraculously transformed. She was a prisoner too, and she was victimized by demonic afflictions just like me. She undoubtedly experienced depression and anxiety, unhappiness and loneliness and self-loathing and shame and fear. But when Jesus came to her rescue, she was completely and instantaneously made clean, like me. She and I discovered that there is much a much more powerful force on the planet than is bigger than the facts of this world. It is the reality of God's word. But honestly, in that moment, looking at that number, looking at that price tag, that label and that demand on my life, I began to lose sight of who I was. Suddenly, it became strikingly clear that the enemy wanted to grab a foothold in my heart again. 
and I could not, after 20 years, allow him to win me over again. So I asked God, I said, cover my pain, and I asked him to overwhelm my heart with a sense of belonging, and he did it. He did it again, and he does it again, and he does it again. I am so glad that this situation didn't come in between my love and my devotion for God because I want to be the woman of faith like Mary Magdalene was. I want to receive the kind of favor and the kind of reward that she did. I want to be that woman who is remembered for being one of Jesus' most loyal followers, like she was. I want the level of reward like Mary received when she was the very first person visited by the angel of the Lord at the resurrection and was told that he was risen. I want that kind of blessing. I want that kind of blessing to be my legacy. I want that to be the heritage I leave my children, and I want that to be their birthright. So let me tell you this morning, I am no longer that orphan with a price tag. No, 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 I'm the one. I'm the one who's been given a new name, a new identity, a new beginning, a new ending, and a new home. I'm the one who's been made clean, totally, spotlessly clean from shame. I'm the one who's been called for such a time as this in my right mind to be able to share my story, and I will never allow those numbers on that page to define my worth, my calling, or who God is to me. He is, and he always will be, a father to the fatherless. I belong to him, and heaven is my home. Anyway, in case you were wondering what kind of people come to this church, well, this is us. Wash me in mercy. 
I'm clean. There was a time in my life that I didn't feel like I was clean. I grew up in church. You know, with a father as a minister and a pastor. My uncles are pastors and ministers. Everything was good. We learned about Jesus. We learned about who he was. He was part of the church growing up. And all that changed at the age of five. Disagreements between my parents. Uh, they got divorced. And in that divorce, everything changed. We were no longer the people in church or the people always going to the church, but we're the people that occasionally went to church. And in that brokenness that I felt, that void in my heart, that we felt it as a family, led us into a, a pit. There was abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. It left a scar in me that I looked at God and I was like, you, you can't be real. If you were real all this time, why did you allow all those things to happen to me? So I went to the world and found a, found a way out there. Try to find peace. Try to find connection with people. Try to find joy. But it just left me depressed, frustrated, angry. And I allowed that anger and that depression and that sadness to just dictate my life. And everyone that came across, every person that came, even when I went to church, I was like, I was one of those people that the church is fake. I didn't care what they were doing. I don't care they were speaking in tongues. I don't care what it was. It was fake to me. Because the people that were close to me did not represent that. I was so hurt and broken. I asked God one time, Lord, I want to, if you are real in my life, I want to see you. I want to experience you. I don't experience you. I'm, not, I'm hearing you. I'm seeing people love you. But I don't feel that inside. So I asked God, if you are real, make that real to me. I can't imagine how in the Bible Peter felt when he walked with Jesus and he followed him. And in a moment of, 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 of change, a moment of, of discomfort when Jesus was being crucified and judged, he denied him three times. And when he looked at Jesus face to face and saw him, he walked away and wept, bit and wept, and wept bitterly. And I spent so many years weeping bitterly, angry. Angry with God, my father, my mother. I wanted change, and I couldn't find that change in nothing. But just like Peter, God had a plan. What does this guy say? God's plan? God's plan. God had a plan. And he told Peter, he knew that Peter was going to deny him. And in my denial, I denied him as well. But he knew Peter was going to deny him. And he told him. You're going to deny me, but I pray for you that your faith will not fail. And when you come back, strengthen my brethren. When the season came for me to accept Jesus again and, and to allow him into my life and look past all the religiousness in the church, look past all the nonsense, look past the foolishness, look past the people that hurt me, I said, Lord, come into my life and allow your, allow your love and what you're about to really shine in me. And God just began to minister to me through all the religion and through all the walls and through all the hurt. Just start to pour out love in my life. Love like I'd never seen before. Love like I'd never heard about Jesus being that. And he started to wash me all this brokenness, all these pieces that were angry, all these pieces that were hurt. And begin to put those pieces back together. It showed me a better way. It showed me a way about love. Jesus restored Peter. He met him on the beach. And on the beach, he told him, he said, do you love me, Peter? He said, yeah. He said, feed my sheep. Three times he asked him that. If it was in my situation, it wasn't three times. Like after the 7,000th time of God asking me, do you love me? I was like, yeah. He said, feed my sheep. I stand to you today no longer like that broken child, that hurt child, that angry child. 
that person that was gave up on life, that gave up on the church, I'm no longer that person now, full with joy, happiness, peace. I don't care what anybody say. No position in the church is greater than Jesus. No words that can be said to me will, will pierce my heart and destroy me. Because I know the love of Jesus. And I stand to you today, strengthening the brethren and the sisters of the body of Christ to show you there is a way. There is, there, there is hope in your darkness. There is hope when you've been hurt by the church. There is hope when you've been hurt by family. I stand today as a restored person. My mother restored. My father restored. My family restored. God blessed me with a wife and five children. You hear all say that all the time. Five children. But they've grown. They're almost leaving. Praise God for that, right? Going to college soon. <laughs> and I see them not doing drugs. I don't see them pregnant. I don't see them... Um, failing in school. I see them with scholarships from college, fully paid scholarships. The grace of God took what was broken and defeated my life and turned it around. I have a favorite movie. If you don't know something about me, I love Star Wars. If everybody know I love Star Wars. That's like Jesus, family, and Star Wars. So sometimes Star Wars and family. I don't know how it goes sometimes. And there's a scene in the movie where Luke Skywalker is looking out to the sun and see the sun setting. He's looking at all the possibilities that can be for him. But he was stuck in a place that cannot bring him. I like to tell you today, I'm no longer in that, 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 that beach looking at the sun. But I'm in, in, the, in the war, in the battle, in, in the place that God has me. And I can say today, I am a Jedi like my father before me, my heavenly father before me. And everything that he is, I am today. So if you're wondering what kind of people come to Sanctuary Fellowship, this is the kind of people that come to say with passion. Broken, hurt, restored, and full of love people. Thank you. Bro. Good morning. My name is Juanita Valentin, and I'd like to tell you my story. I, you might be asking why is she telling her story in a park bench outside in the winter because it's still not spring yet. <laughs> well, I'm telling you my story in this particular bench because this bench is very significant, a significant part of my story. 30 years ago, um, I was living with what is now my ex-husband. At that time, he was strung out on drugs and my three children and I were going through a lot of devastation in our home. And because of his addiction, he was constantly taking the money for the home and doing drugs, you know, buying drugs with it. And so because of that, our children were suffering and so was I and bills that had to be paid at a certain time were delayed. But um, I wanna tell you over one particular night where my husband was out, strung out on drugs, and um, he needed, he wanted more money. So he showed up at like three o'clock in the morning back into the house and woke me up with a knife to my throat and um, threatened me because he wanted money. And I threatened him that I would call the police. And so he ran. And at that point, I did call the police. The police asked me if there was a place that I can go to and so I told them, yes, I can go to my sister's house. I ended up here because my sister lives in the building on this, the right side of me. And um, since it was in the middle of the night, it's a private building, the doors were locked. My sister didn't have a phone. So I waited on this bench and I actually slept on this bench all night with my youngest daughter. She was four years old. And um, I thank God at that time that my older two children were at summer camp and they didn't have to see any of the devastation that was going on that night. But they had seen a lot in our home. Like I said before, my husband was strung out on crack. So we lived a life where he was constantly robbing from us or being violent with us. And the end of the story is that God is faithful. He's always protected me. He never allowed me to be harmed and my, all my children, he protected them. And I just thank God that during this whole walk, we were attached to a church where the children were able to see good examples and my son had male mentors that were an example of the life of Christ that helped him as well growing up. 
So I just want to say with my story that God has been faithful. And if you're going through any situation, even similar to mine, I just want to tell you that God is faithful. Trust in him. Believe that he will see you through. Because if not for God, I would not be sitting here. God has been so faithful to me. He protected me. He provided, even though my husband stole money from us. He provided. We ate still. Our children were protected. And I just thank God that today I'm able to sit here 30 years later and tell you that God has been faithful. That is the testimony of my life. And so I just want to tell you, this is us. This is us. And I'm glad and I'm, I'm happy that you're listening to my story. And I hope that it could be beneficial to you. And I pray to God that something from this will touch you. And if you're hurting, call on God. He will help you. If he helped me, he has no respect of person. He helped me through it all. He'll help you too. Because God loves you and he cares for you as he cared for me and cares for me even now. Thank you for listening to my story. Amen. Hey, I was born I was born Jewish in Brooklyn many years ago. A long time it was so long my social security number is one. You know how long ago it was? I was watching Jurassic Park last night and it was bringing back old memories. But I was born in Brooklyn, but when I was young, my family moved to Long Island. But everything fell apart. When I was five years old, my father left. And my mother right away remarried an alcoholic who was extremely abusive. Oh, I used to, in the house, I used to sleep in the basement apartment. And many times when he would beat my mother, I could hear him. My mother hit the floor right above me. It would shake the whole ceiling. You see, every now and then someone will tell me, well, you don't understand what I went through. You grew up in Long Island. You lived in a nice house. You can't understand suffering. You see, sometimes you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. You don't see many times the abuse. Many times we look at the outwards and don't see the hurt and pain because, because we judge by what we see. But behind closed doors, there's so much suffering, so many broken people. And as I got older, I had a hunger to know God. But the only avenue open to me was the Jewish religion. Jewish people didn't go to church. Nobody told me about Jesus. So I started to go to the synagogue, which is basically a church where Jewish people go. But I didn't find God. All I found was religious rituals and traditions. They gave me a giant prayer book or a book filled with rules and say, here, just keep this. They told me that God, he's unknowable. He's far away. And I became to become, began to become disheartened, but I went away to a, to a Jewish school called the yeshiva, where I said, I want to be a rabbi. I, I want to change things. I, I, I want to learn how, how to lead, how to teach. A rabbi basically is a pastor in the Jewish faith. And while I was there in the yeshiva, I joined a militant organization. And I, I became basically a thug. Where's the picture? Put, there we go. I got proof right here. That's why even today I look so gangster all the time. <laughs> you see, I, I thought I was doing God's work, being angry, fighting, rioting in the streets. I was arrested many times. I'm talking about at 15 and 16, I'd already been to jail a bunch of times. But I kept praying, and I couldn't find God. And finally, I gave up. I, I said, there is no God. This can't be real. And even if God was real, why did he allow all these things to happen? 
And why is there so much suffering in the world? And why do good people have to go through so many bad things? I became a professional atheist, God-hater. I used to go to college writing papers on a mission to prove that there was no God. If somebody came and told me the gospel, I would tell them, oh, those people are just after your money. Don't, don't follow that. That stuff is fake. Well, 30 years later, I'm going to skip way forward. I found Jesus. And I developed a true relationship with the one who created me, that the creator of the universe, I found out that he's real, that he's near, that I could know him, that I could walk with him. That in my hurt, that he would be there with me. Not, not the God of dead religions, where it's all about reading out of a book and doing all these rituals. He's a real God. And I began to know him. And, and over the years, I, I became a pastor. See, my original vision to become a pastor in the Jewish religion never happened as a rabbi, but it happened as a pastor in the church of the living God. You see, and as a pastor, the one in the Bible I most identify, identify with was a man named Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. See, I believe being a pastor isn't about becoming famous, getting attention, getting enough likes on Facebook, building your kingdom, building your ministry. But Barnabas was one who cared. His heart was to build up others. He took Paul the apostle when he was a failure, and he went, reached down and he picked him up. And he, he walked with him over the years. Or another man named John Mark. He was in the Bible. They took him out on a trip into a dangerous place. And when things got hard, he ran away. And Paul said, forget him. We're going to write that, that John Paul off, John Mark. He's a failure. But that wasn't the heart of Barnabas. He said, no, he's got destiny. And he was patient. And because of that, we have the gospel of Mark today. Because this man, Barnabas, he loved people through their hurts and their wounds. You see, finally, my wife passed away two weeks ago. After 20 years. And I, I didn't expect it. I thought it would be just like all the other times where she was in the hospital, and, and many times they said, well, this is it, she's not going to make it, and God did a miracle. But this time there was no miracle. It didn't work out the way I expected. I still have questions. But I want to proclaim to you that after years, those years of doubting the goodness of God, I want to proclaim to you on this Easter day that in spite of all, all that I just said, in spite of what I don't understand, in spite of the grief and the pain, I want to proclaim to you that Jesus is real, he's on the throne, and he is a good God, and he deserves all our worship and praise and adoration. Anyway, in case you were wondering what kind of people go to church, or what kind of people come here? Well, this is us. Wow. Amen, amen. This might seem like the strangest Easter Sunday presentation we could ever have done. It's Easter Sunday. Shouldn't we be talking about the cross? Shouldn't we be talking about the grave and how three days later and, and how the stone was rolled away and how the apostles and his followers saw Jesus alive and, and it changed their lives so much that they devoted their lives to telling people their stories? And yet, isn't that exactly what we're doing? 
Because he rose, we can have hope for a future. Because he rose, we can rejoice today. Because he was broken, we can take our broken lives and make them beautiful and make them count and make them matter. And we can say, this is us, the one he loved. This is us, the ones he came for. This is us, the ones he paid the price for. Amen? And can I add one final story? I'd like to do it this way. Who am I? I'm you. It's Easter Sunday. Got dressed up today. Might not always come to church, but today I made a way. Resurrection. Put on a good face. How you doing? I'm blessed. Fake perfection. Sing a song. Hear the word. Three points and a prayer. At least when somebody asks, I can say that I was there. But nobody knows the pain I've been in or the trouble I've seen or the weight of my sin. They won't love me probably think they're better than me. I wish I could be the people they pretend to be, social media. Even the church has infected my testimony, auto-corrected, hypocritical, pharisaical, self-righteous churches, keeping people from worship. But as you just heard, that's not our story. We're broken people coming together, made whole by and for his glory. As for me personally, your pastor, never saw myself as religious. But since a teen, I knew there had to be more than this. More than just Sunday. More than just stand, sit, kneel, pray. More than just lighting a candle or the sign of the cross. I read in the book that he came for the lost. Who am I? I'm you. I've been lost too. My search for truth brought me to some strange places. My search for love, some strange faces. Looking for love in all the wrong places. All the while there was you, took my sin on the cross, trading spaces. Mm. Looking for love in all the wrong places. All the while there was you, took my sin on the cross, trading spaces. All that I've done, all the wrong I've come from. Who am I? I'm you. Coming out on Easter just to pay my dues. But fam, there's more to this. You were born for so much more than this. Born for such a time as this. Destiny. You're not your own. You belong to him. Community. Bread of life. Living water. Eternity. But do I have to come to be one? No, it was done in the sun. But he says, come to me. Be one with me. Find a place you belong and come grow with me. While you were at your worst, I came for you, incarnation. While you were still running, laid my life for you, crucifixion. Before you got it right, I rose for you, resurrection. So that anyone who believes would have life, eternal salvation. And so we welcome and bless you this morning. This place is a safe house, sanctuary, a place to enjoy God, building healthy families. And so in case you were wondering what kind of people come to church nowadays or what kind of people come here, we're people just like you, not a perfect one among us, taking it day by day, making mistakes, trusting God all the way, this
Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on. <laughs> wow. Wasn't that wonderful? And my is it is this stuff falling off the ceiling? Because I feel like a lot of my eyes been bothering me today. <laughs> and I wasn't expecting the split too. That threw me off, but that was awesome, man. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. We got some talented children in this church, man. <laughs> Wow, this is the next generation, man, and we're just trying to build healthy families here. Nobody said that we were going to be perfect at it, but like, like Pastor said in the spoken word, we're just moving day by day, just trying to get this right. This is us. What you see here today is us. We could have put on an elaborate, you know, uh, 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 in terms of like, a, 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 you know, just a scene and, and, and had just like, I think one, one time we had a horse come in here, right? <laughs> Didn't we have a, we had a, like a live horse come through here, which was awesome, you know? <laughs> but the more, but the more you, but the more you walk this walk in the Lord, the, and, 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 and you know, sometimes you only have just this one day to really speak to people. So you want to speak to people and you want to let them know like, you know, Jesus, is alive. he's alive and we celebrate him, but we want to celebrate you for being here, for taking the chance to come here and hear a word from God. But to let you know that we're just like you. We're ones that are broken, that need to be made whole. Ones that need forgiveness each and every day. Some of us that got some things that we're still struggling with that we need God. If God wasn't in our life, we would just fall apart. We would never make it. But he's been faithful. He's been faithful. So what you see here today is a young man. Can I still say that at 44, young man? <laughs> what you see is a, a man. <laughs> My story... And I just want to share this real quick. I grew up in a crack house, man. You know, not to just make it real sad right now, but the reality is, is that my home was the place that crackheads went to get drugs. And to the point where we were even trained up at one point to sell it, you know. And so to look back so long ago and see how God has been faithful, you know, in retrospect, you start seeing the hand of God and how he moved. You're like, wow, man, I, I was never alone. During those times when I cried, God was always there just saying, I got destiny for you. And one day you're going to speak and you're going to share a testimony. And now don't eat that. I didn't even know I could sing at that point. And now I sing <laughs> every day for God, man. That's all I want to do. I just want to worship. So you may be thinking, well, I don't have what you have. You might have something even better. For a group of people that need what you got. So if you're wondering what kind of people come to this church, <laughs> this is us. Can we stand to our feet and just leave with a celebration? Only King Forever. We opened with this song. Let's close with this song. Come on.
nothing left to say but happy Easter. You are blessed. Continue to be a blessing. Have a wonderful week. And we want to invite you back here next Sunday. Our doors are open. This is us. Two o'clock. If you're here and if you have Spanish-speaking family, you can come back here. We have another amazing service happening at two o'clock today. God bless you.